Hi, I'm Lisa Fletcher, and you're in the stream. Today, he has rock star status among space lovers and nearly a million Twitter followers. The famed astrophysicist, author, and educator, Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson, joins us live from New York. This is your chance to ask him anything you want, because we've got him for the whole show. Our digital producer, Malika Bilal, is here looking out for all your live feedback. Malika, it's funny how a guy like Dr. Tyson gets tweets from third graders, he gets tweets from triple PhDs, and everybody in between. I mean, when you're talking about somebody with the it factor, right. it's him. And that's putting it mildly. Not many scientists can say that they've trended nationally on Twitter, as Neil deGrasse Tyson did. You can see the tweet on my screen in which he thanks America for letting it happen. Or can say that they've got a viral meme named after them, and this one comes from a YouTube video in which he explains <laughs> how Sir Isaac Newton invented calculus before his 26th birthday, putting us all to shame, I think. Yeah, but for those of you at home, we want you to join the conversation, so if you have a question, send it to us with the hashtag AJStream. All right, and members of our online community, they're always excited about getting into our Google Plus Hangout, but today was a seriously competitive situation. Everyone wants to ask a question of Neil deGrasse Tyson. Congrats to those who will get the opportunity in just a few minutes. Now, as we mentioned, Neil is an astrophysicist with a long list of accomplishments. He's the director of the Hayden Planetarium in New York, and he hosts a show that combines science and comedy called Star Talk. He's also had three of the top 10 most popular Ask Me Anything sessions ever on the online discussion forum Reddit. And he's written a number of books. The latest is called Space Chronicles, Facing the Ultimate Frontier. Neil, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Thank you. My first time on this, so, so bring it on. Oh, we're going to bring it on. <laughs> Let's start with this article that was published in the journal Nature yesterday. The psychologist Dean Simonton, he posed the question, is scientific genius extinct? And he argues that there are lots of creative scientists, but the true geniuses who surprise us with discoveries that really provoke these momentous leaps are pretty much gone, particularly because he says all that's left to do now is connect the dots that we already know exist. So is, is genius discovery gone, leaving us just to you know, extend knowledge we already have? Okay, I think he's right, but for the wrong reason. Uh, there's certainly geniuses of the ranks of those who have come before us who walk among us, all right? So I'm, I have no doubt that they're there. The question is, are they giving their attention to the kinds of things that would lead to such discoveries? That's first, but more important, there was a time when the frontier of physics or biology or, or chemistry, when the frontier was accessible on the, on the, on the lab table. And uh, I, I know physics best, so let me, or an astrophysics best, so let me restrict my comment to that. So, so you build a telescope, you set up an experiment on the lab, and it's an experiment that no one has done before. You're reaching for energies no one has seen before. You're seeing objects no one had known were there before. And so now you say, all right, how will I take a leap beyond that? Well, I need a bigger machine. I need a bigger telescope. And this ascent to bigger and bigger experiments to reach out into the world requires more and more money, more, a bigger and bigger lab, more and more collaborations. And so now the great discoveries in astrophysics and in physics come about from huge collaborations. And in there, you'll find your geniuses, but access to the operations of nature no longer comes to you from a tabletop. And I think that's the primary reason you're not reading about the lone genius burning the midnight candle who is making the discovery that will transform the world. Okay, we're going to dive right into in here with these community questions. There's one on Reddit, and Lisa mentioned Reddit earlier and how you trended there with your AMAs. This is a question from Tsingi who says, do you think there is life on Mars? But before you answer that, I know there's another Mars question in our hangout from Stefan. Stefan is a student at Georgia State University in Atlanta, Georgia. Go ahead. Hello, Tyson. It's uh, great to be able to speak to you today. And my question is, what are your predictions on the possibilities surrounding space travel and human space development? Basically, do you think we'll have uh, a human landing of Mars by 2050? Uh, I think if we don't, uh, first, that's an excellent question. If we don't, then uh, in the United States, we will have regressed economically uh, over that period of time. Uh, in my judgment, and I'm, I detail this in, in the book, that once you go into space in a big way and advance us frontier, 
every next step that you take has never been taken before. So the press writes about it. It's all the buzz. It, it enters the blogosphere. People tweet about it. Look at the attention this guy got from jumping out of a balloon from what they called the edge of space, where at the time I tweeted, well, let's back up for a minute and take a look at a schoolroom globe. How high is that guy's jump to a schoolroom globe? And that jump would have become one millimeter above its surface. Yet we all were bought into the fact that he was jumping from the edge of space because it was from a height never be achieved before. I claim that if we have astronauts headed to Mars, you wouldn't have heard anything about this guy <laughs> jumping out of a balloon from this, heart, this high, but the fact, so, so I, more power to the guy, but I lament, rather than celebrate him, I'm lamenting that we didn't have something better to cheer, but like Neil, going to Mars. Why, and it's, why do we yeah. want to go to Mars? No, here's what I'm saying. You can go because you want to discover, that's one, but that's never enough to get people to write the check my read of history tells yeah. me. And you, so, so the check writing comes about when people feel they're threatened. That's what happened when we birthed NASA in 1958. What happened a year and a day before NASA was founded? Sputnik was launched. And the Russians, the Soviet Union, had, had this hollowed out intercontinental ballistic missile shell, which they put a radio transmitter in it, so that rendered it harmless. But the military folks knew that if they can put a satellite over our head, they can deliver a nuclear weapon we were spooked into action. When we reflect on NASA, we say, oh, we're discoverers and we're explorers. The fact is, we went into space because we were scared witless. Can I say that? You, you can say <laughs> we that. We were scared. <laughs> <laughs> witless, yes. Uh, we were scared witless. And so, yes, in response to military threats, of course, we would go to, if China said they want to put military bases on Mars, We'd be we're there. there in 10 months. Uh -huh. Like, we have one month to design, build, fund the craft, and, <laughs> and then n nine months to travel. So, so my point is, no one wants to do any of this motivated by war, but the tandem, the, the associated benefit to this is that everyone starts thinking scientifically. They start thinking about innovations. We become an innovation nation, whether or not you're a scientist. If you're a lawyer, you'll say, oh, there might be mining opportunities on Mars. Let's explore what the legalities are of that. If you're an artist, you start drawing images of the universe. So if you're a screenwriter, your storytelling takes on another flavor. That's what happened in the 60s. So the future economies will flow out of innovations in science and technology, and the greatest carrot for people to want to be scientists and engineers are, is the exploration of space. Well, Neil, you mentioned, you mentioned the 60s. There's a Facebook comment here from Adam. He says, do you think it's going to take another Cold War scenario for the U.S. to seriously invest in the space program? It, uh, another Cold War equivalent would do it, yes. But I don't want that to be the driver. I mean, I've joked that I want to visit you know, the head of China and whisper and say, Psst, leak a memo saying you want to put military bases on Mars. You are not a <laughs> trouble maker at all. <laughs> <laughs> the hey, Pentagon finds out about it. <laughs> not only are you a troublemaker, uh, you know, you're also the sexiest astrophysicist of the year, according to People magazine. How does one get that title? Oh, that, was, uh, that, uh, that was some years ago, 13 years ago. I'm honored, but uh, consider the category. I mean, come on. I mean, yeah, if I were the sexiest action star, then that's something to boast about. But to, I'm, I'm just a scientist. and so No, dude, I think tech-savvy okay. guys are waiting for you to start doing tech-savvy underwear modeling. <laughs> you know, right? It would fit perfectly with that. I, uh, that uh, maybe 50 pounds ago I could have done such a thing, but, but not now. Uh, so what, what I was saying about the going to Mars is you can make an economic case. And <laughs> economics is the second biggest driver of human conduct that there ever was. First is military, just defense. And the second is I want to get rich. <laughs> so you can invert it and say the I don't want to die driver and the I don't want to die poor driver. And so that's, so that's just to, to, to put a bow on that Mars question. Well, you know, if you're talking about getting rich, you can talk about mining the asteroids, right? I mean, that's, that's actually something that is, that is being pushed now. Yeah, so, so there are the direct applications of space where one can gain wealth. And that would, of course, be the mining of asteroids. There are asteroids out there that are made of mostly metal. And the metal that, it, that, the metal that they're comprised of is all of the things that we typically call rare earth elements. Well, they're rare Earth, but they're not rare universe, right? You go out into the universe, you can find hunks of metal where they are 
abundant in the iridium and the cobalt and all these all these materials that we use for high-tech manufacturing and other sort of exotic applications that help define 21st century civilization. But that's not the wealth that I'm referring to. I'm referring to the fact that if you have an innovation nation stimulated by the fact that we're on a moving frontier inventing stuff, then the fact that people have this interest changes what kind of world you live in. Because now they have the power to invent something that they imagine that they would want to have tomorrow. And the power to invent something to realize a dream is what enables nations to move into their own future. Otherwise, you just recede. And that's what America is going to do. So we're either going to be on Mars in 50 years, 35, 38 years, or we're going to be 10th in the economic scale of the world. Well, let's realize the dreams the of, of some of the people in our hangout uh, who'd like to ask you questions. I want to go to Nicole now, who's speaking to us from Raleigh, North Carolina. Nicole runs a blog called The Noisy Astronomer. Go ahead. Hi, Neil. Um, astrophysics is heading into an era of large publicly available data sets and, and all sky surveys like we've never seen before. Uh, how do you think that changes how astronomers are doing their jobs and how astronomy is then communicated to the public? Uh, yeah, I just uh, what you know is probably what most people don't know there is that we are now gathering data at such a rate with our largest telescopes, not only ground based but space based, that the people who planned that telescope and who proposed the funding to build it, they can't possibly analyze. The, well, they can, an, they can take a first pass at it, but the t to completely mine the data set, to plumb it for all the science that it has to offer, requires many more people than even perhaps the entire scientific community can supply. So there's this, uh, there's this new frontier where you're sourcing your data to the interested public who might have a few hours to give to it. And and you give some instructions, we're looking for this pattern, can you see it? Can you find it? Here are some tools. So yes, it's completely changed how we do large-scale surveys. In the old days, it was the lone person collecting data, creating a catalog, and you'd be turning pages in a catalog, seeing if anything interesting was there. Uh, so, uh, so in a way, the sheer scale of the data set has democratized uh, the scientific enterprise. And I think that's a good thing. It's different, but it's not bad. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's good. Well, there's a question here. It's it left in a video comment format. Have a listen, Neil. I'm Andrew. And I'm five. I want. I want to know why Pluto's not a planet anymore. He asks, "Why is Pluto not a planet anymore?" And of course, you've been called a Pluto killer. Do you care to tell us about that? Well, so you know, when you're five, you know, you probably know that Mickey has a dog called Pluto and you heard that there was this planet called Pluto that's not a planet. I think if there wasn't a dog with that name, the five-year-old wouldn't, could care less, all right? <laughs> uh, you know, if we demoted Uranus, do you think he would care? Do you think people would write in? Do you think I'd have a file cabinet this deep of hate mail from third graders <laughs> if we had demoted some planet other than Pluto? Uh, in fact, I wrote a book, my previous book was uh, The Pluto Files, The Rise and Fall of America's Favorite Planet, and it chronicled this chapter in our history, in our American history and scientific history as well, recent history. Uh, yes, it upset a lot of third graders, and I don't blame them for feeling Not bad. Not just third graders, to be fair. I was pretty upset, too. It changed the mnemonic. <laughs> well, My very you. elegant you. mother <laughs> just had nine. <laughs> nine what? Right, exactly. okay. So you get over it, right? <laughs> so, so you're grown up, you can get over it, right? So... Um, no, Good Pluto advice. had it coming from way back. It's, it's, way, it's way smaller than all the other planets, and there's six <laughs> moons bigger than Pluto. It's half ice. It would grow a tail <laughs> if it were at Earth's <laughs> distance from the sun, from the heat of the sun, and it just had it coming. <laughs> Plus, we found other objects in the outer solar system that look like Pluto, more like Pluto than any of them look like the rest of the planets. So we didn't simply demote Pluto. We assigned it to a new class of object recently discovered, and I think Pluto's happier there. <laughs> so, so the problem here is not the demotion. The problem is the solar system was taught in a way where you were to memorize the enumeration of the nine planets. And so you're thinking that there's something magical, something scientific about the nine. And that number is irrelevant to everything. 
what you should have, the way you should have been taught the solar system, in retrospect, is what kinds of objects are there? There are rocky objects, gaseous, um, uh, some are round, some look like potatoes. Just talk about classes of objects in the solar system. When you do that, you find out where Pluto belongs. Hey, Neil, talking about... So, so, just speaking about... So just get over it. Kids, <laughs> kids in general and, and education, how do we re-energize kids uh, uh, to have an interest with science? It just seems like that's really, in the last couple of decades, there's such a lack of interest in that area. Yeah, so I, I've done a lot of thinking on this, and that's going to be yet another book down the line when other things come off my shelf, out of the way to get to it. But I am certain about this, that the challenge is not the kids. Yeah. The challenge is not scientifically illiterate kids, it's scientifically illiterate adults who are in charge of agencies, money, funds, uh, mission statements. Adults outnumber kids and they run the world. And they have their fingers on buttons. So... It's their scientific illiteracy that I've been primarily concerned with. Now about kids, they're born scientifically curious. They turn over leaves and rocks and they jump two feet into mud puddles. They're experimenting with the natural world. And what do we do as adults? We say, stop, you're getting things dirty. Don't play with that, you might break it. Don't spill the liquid, it'll get things dirty. And we just put in the don't do list. And most of everything we say that a kid should not do squashes some path of scientific inquiry. And I, when I raised my kids, I got two kids, when I raised them, I gave them scientific freedoms throughout the house, which meant at the end of the day, I got to clean up after them. But everything they poke and touch and almost break, from my view, through the lens of the world through which I look, they're conducting scientific experiments. And, and luckily you weren't the only creativity. parent to do that. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, but luckily you weren't the only parent to do that because we have a video comment from Brittany. And Brittany is the winner of last year's Google International Science Fair. She created a new non-invasive way to detect breast cancer. Listen to her question for you. My name is Brittany Wanger, and my question is, do you think strong artificial intelligence is a real future possibility? And if so, do you think it's something we'll want to code in the future? Thank you so much. International, uh, artificial uh, intelligence. Yeah, I mean, I, artificial intelligence to me is not fundamentally different from artificial anything else that we now just accept as part of our lives. I mean, let's broaden the concept of artificial. I was in the airport yesterday and I was in one of those sort of monorails that goes between stations. There is no driver. The thing goes to where it's going, stops, opens the doors, closes the doors. So that's sort of, there's an artificial driver, if you will. It's called a computer. We, we, there's so many things that used to be done by humans that we no longer do to now say, well, artificial intelligence, that's just the next thing, all right? Computers already beat us in chess. They already calculate faster. They already, they're machines that are stronger than we are and can move faster than we can. So it's just, it just put another check in a box for the next thing that things we create that can, uh, uh, that can do things either as good or better than we can. Uh, I don't have a problem with that. And yeah, I hope it comes sooner rather than later. Neil, then I can go to the ball game while it's figuring out what I <laughs> otherwise have to do. <laughs> Speaking of what you otherwise <laughs> have to do, I'm, I'm curious, what, what baffles you? What baffles me? Yeah. Baffles. Uh, I'm baffled by the depth to which a person can be certain of something that is objectively false. I'm, I'm stunned by this. And it's, uh, I mean, it's the, it's the field of psychologists. They gotta worry about this, and maybe ultimately neuroscientists. But uh, a friend of mine, Michael Shermer, wrote a book, Why People Believe Weird Things. And, uh, he, I mean, he's devoted a big part of his professional life to thinking about that problem. And so I'm, I'm baffled. I just don't understand it. And when I confront such people, the best I can do is offer access to the objective reality that surrounds us and hope that they grab for it because you, you can live a more fulfilled life that way. Uh, so now in terms of other uh, uh, things that baffle me in the universe, oh, there's tons. I'm baffled every day. Like what is dark matter? What is dark energy? How did, how did inanimate organic molecules become animate? And, and, and transform into life. What was around before the universe? Is there a multiverse? Are there multiverses of multiverses? Uh, oh yeah, I, we can go on for, in fact, 
if I, for, no, if I may offer a cheap plug, <laughs> I just finished a video series with the teaching company that I'll call the Great Courses Series, mm -hmm. uh, called the, oh, what did I call it, the, 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 the unknown, I forgot the title, forgive me, but it's like the, the unknown universe. It's, th their lectures, I give s only six lectures, mm -hmm. where I talk about the stuff we don't know. How we got to the edge, and I take you, the viewer, to the edge, and then I push you over the edge. <laughs> the edge of what is known, the boundary between what is known and unknown. I just push you off and say, yep, we don't know anything about that. <laughs> All right? So, so most things you buy or read tell you about what is known, and yeah. you get this sort of false sense of, of security in our state of knowledge. And I thought it was high time that, um, just high time that I would expose people to that bleeding, hairy edge where scientists are still duking it out because we don't actually have the answers yet. Bleeding and hairy. <laughs> That's a good, good way to put yeah, it. It's, it's, I think so. <laughs> the, un, the unsolved universe. Yes. Uh, uh, the, the, the unsolved mysteries of the unknown universe. Something, you find it in, in we'll the, find uh, it. the Great Courses series. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, uh, while we're looking for that, uh, well, let's go to Google Hangout where Sayed has a question. Sayed speaking to us from Hanover, Connecticut, and he has a master's in uh, public health, or uh, sorry, he's a candidate for a master's in public health. Go ahead, Sayed. Uh, hi, Dr. Tyson. Thank you so much for your time. It's a real honor. I'm a bit starstruck. There's a pun there. Um, after reading your autobiography, I was wondering what would you identify as a catalyst that took you from being an astrophysicist to a dedicated promoter of scientific literacy among the youth in America? Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, like I said, while youth can be a part of what I do, uh, youth are rarely ever my target. My target is adults, is like full up adults scientifically illiterate adults. And so, but youth sort of come with me on that journey. Uh, so uh, that transition, I would not never say it was a transition. I think when you study the universe, and I'm speaking for, my, for myself as well as my colleagues, when you study the universe, we do stuff that is fundamentally interesting to the public. If we discover a black hole, that's page one news story. And every local news calls their local astronomer and calls their local planetarium and their local astronomy department. So I'm not alone in my access to media. Uh, and, and media already has an appetite, and I'm just feeding it. Now, I happen to have access to more kinds of media than many of my colleagues, but that doesn't change the fundamental fact that they're coming to us. I'm, I didn't say, can I be on Al Jazeera? Like, can I be on Google Plus? You guys came to me. I was just home minding my own business, okay? <laughs> and I'm perfectly happy there, okay? <laughs> so I get called out. I got called to do the Ask Me Anything um, interview uh, sessions on, on Reddit. And I'm honored and it's a privilege to have people feel that way. So it's not that I decided one day I shall be Mr. Educator. Uh, it's the people's hunger for more of the universe married to my ability to share the universe with the public that has created this this entire uh, landscape and the Twitter following and all of this. Uh, that Twitter following, it didn't come because I did something famous one day and everybody just signed on like like Charlie Sheen. But Charlie Sheen said, I have a Twitter account. The next day he had a million, you know. So it's not because they enjoyed his previous tweets. It's because he has a fan <laughs> factor that mattered there. So I, my, so my Twitter following, I think, was hard earned. Like, I'm, but there's a tweet in there. It is like my brain droppings on the universe. And people like it. They retweet it. And so if you look at it, there are no sharp jumps in that. It's like I'm in a slow growth. That means there's an appetite. And I'm just feeding that appetite. That's all. Well, there's only 45 seconds left in our main show, uh, but there's a question here uh, left on our Facebook page um, uh, from Enik, and you can answer it in our post show. If you were to set the music to set the universe to music, what would the music be? But we'll, we'll tease that for the post show. Please. All right, Dr. Tyson, you think oh, about that. Okay. <laughs> Everyone, stay tight. The, the post answer show is, is next <laughs> at streamtothealthzero.com. Now on Monday. Every February, the U.S. and Canada celebrate African American heritage during what's known as Black History Month. But has this been effective in combating racism? Send us your thoughts and your questions on that. And until then, we'll see you online.
Welcome to the Post Show on the stream. We're talking with astrophysicist Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson. And we want to pick up where we left off. One of our Facebook commenters asked you, Dr. Tyson, if you could set the universe to music, to what song would it be? Uh, that's easy. Well, first of all, many different things happen in the universe, and not all things can be served by the same kind of music. For example, when the asteroid strikes, uh -huh. okay, that's a different song from when two stars enter sort of in a balletic exchange of angular momentum. Uh, I, I happen to like the music that uh, Stanley Kubrick and others selected for 2001, uh -huh. uh, a Strauss waltz, for when you have objects in orbit. Uh, it's really a dance choreographed by the forces of gravity where planets, moons, just go about their appointed paths that you can actually calculate. But without, without a, a, a sight line to the equations, if you just sat back and basked in this orbital majesty, I think a beautiful Strauss, Strauss waltz well, would work. I, we got to get now back in terms to, of... Yeah? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, no, so, but it, w when an asteroid strikes, uh, I don't know, maybe Night on Bald Mountain, something, something <laughs> sort of catastrophic. Well, uh, that's yeah. actually what I wanted and to get back to. at the end, uh, not... I wanted to get back uh, to that. Night on Bald Mountain ends, ends very peacefully, and so uh -huh. that's when everything is dead after the asteroid strikes. <laughs> You're saying when the asteroid strikes. I'd prefer it if you said if the asteroid strikes. What do you mean by when? No, it's a when. Yeah, no, it's totally a when. Uh, how far out <laughs> is this when? <laughs> Uh, uh, there's, there's countless thousands, probably uh, at last count, uh, we're rising through 10,000 asteroids that could do severe damage to Earth, whose orbits cross Earth's orbit. And so eventually we will collide with them. There's none in the very near future of that scale, uh, but <coughs> we know they're out there. We just need to get better data on where they are and what their trajectories are. So uh, I, I have no answer for you just yet. <laughs> uh, but we need more research into it. But they're out there. Well, hopefully you'll have an answer for the next question for, from our Google Plus Hangout. Jonathan Cannon is a Ph.D. candidate in mathematical neuroscience in Boston. Go ahead. Hi. Um, I understand that the top priorities right now in uh, astronomy are exoplanets and black holes. Planets outside the solar system. No, not black holes, rather. Uh, dark energy. What do you think will be the next big uh, breakthroughs on, in those fields, and when do you think they'll happen? And what do you think will be the uh, implications for humanity and science? Yeah, uh, great. Uh, actually, I can uh, answer that quite simply. Let me fix my earplug here. So the uh, exoplanets is, doesn't involve new physics. Uh, it's, we're, we're cataloging planets out there beyond our solar system. Uh, which we've been doing now for about the last 18 years, but very few of those planets look like Earth. And so we finally sent up a telescope, it's called the Kepler, that is tuned for finding Earth-like planets around Sun-like stars. As that catalog grows, it'd be interesting to see how we as a solar system fit in that spectrum of what the universe creates out there uh, among their star systems. And so that would be informationally interesting. And we might target certain stars that have Earth-like planets as the first places we might visit if we can ever figure out how to travel between the stars. Uh, or at least until then we can maybe choose those targets at, for radio signals. In terms of dark matter, we have no idea what dark matter is, or dark energy for that matter. We can measure it, we just have no idea. And I don't know that those solutions are in the near future. Uh, we, the dark matter problem has been with us for most of the 20th century, beginning 1936 essentially. And so uh, I hope, I, I hope it doesn't go uh, outlive my lifetime. Uh, the, that I hope the igno my igno we, our ignorance of the solution to that problem doesn't outlive me. And so perhaps in the next 10 or 20 years we'll have some handle on it. And it's probably some new kind of physics, a new kind of particle, a new understanding of the fabric of space-time. And so that's a bigger problem to be solved than just the exploration of exoplanets. Dr. Tyson, what do you see as the role of the private sector in space? I mean, companies like SpaceX and Sierra Nevada Corporation, they seem to be doing very innovative work. Are they, in your view, ultimately going to replace NASA, work in concert with NASA? How do you see this playing out? Yeah, they, no, they can't replace NASA. It's not possible because NASA at its best is 
on a frontier of space exploration. And when you're on a frontier, it's hugely expensive, a lot of untested uh, machinery that you're bringing to bear on that. The risks are unquantified. And when you combine all of that, you can't establish a capital market valuation of that activity. And so governments historically have always done the big expensive things first. Once the patents have been established, once the trade winds have been mapped and the coastlines have been drawn, then commercial enterprise comes in and can do the routine things that uh, where the first steps were already uh, had been taken by governments. Even, even with Columbus, the, you know, the first Europeans to the New World were not the Dutch East India Trading Company. It was Columbus, funded by Spain. They had other investors as well, but it was a national initiative. He decided who the friendlies were and who the, the enemies were and where to go and how to get there. And uh, then came the commerce. That's how it's always been. Uh, that being said, NASA has always been together with industry. Uh, NASA doesn't build everything it flies. Uh, it contracts that out. And so, so the relationship between NASA and private enterprise has always been there. The difference is, will private enterprise do its own thing? And that, yes, and I think that should have happened decades ago. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned NASA, and so in our Hangout, we have Jonathan Cannon, uh, excuse me, John Zeller, who is the co-founder of something called PennyForNASA.org. Uh, our, our viewers can go look for it there. John is speaking to us from Oregon. Go ahead. Hey, Dr. Sison. Uh, as you know, scientific literacy is a huge aspect of gaining support for space exploration. If there was one piece of hypothetical legislation that could be introduced tomorrow, what do you think would have the biggest positive impact on improving scientific literacy in the United States? Uh, I give the, that's a great question. I give the more fleshed out details in, in the book Space Chronicles, but if I had one piece of legislation, I'd say double or triple NASA's budget, create a suite of launch vehicles that can get us anywhere we choose in the solar system. And different combinations of launch vehicles would serve the scientists, the military, if they have such incentives, there could be geopolitical reasons for going into space, economic reasons, tourist reasons, mining reasons, and then all of space becomes our backyard. And we, don't, no, we no longer have to have these conversations. Where do we go next? Should we go to Mars or go to the moon? We go everywhere. And when you do that, the entire nation becomes a participant on our frontier that converts what we are now, which I don't even know what to call it, into what we once were, and that was an innovation nation. That legislation could overnight transform everybody. Then people will want to become scientifically literate. You don't have to create programs to legislate that you, now we need better teachers to, yes, you need teachers. But that doesn't change the country. The country has to be doing something so that as a kid, you can say, I want to do that when I grow up. And yes. so every one of my generation is doing what we're doing because of what we saw the government do. It was an enlightened period. And it's time to resurrect that in our, in our frontiers of, 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 of political discourse. Well, there's a great follow-up in our hangout from Evan. Evan Schur is the, the creator of YouTube video, Neil deGrasse Tyson, We Stop Dreaming. I don't know if you've checked that out, uh, Dr. Tyson, but Evan yeah, has a question. Yeah. Go ahead, Evan. Hi, Dr. Tyson. Uh, um, compared to many other areas of investment, space travel is astronomically expensive. Will we ever reach a point where the price tag becomes so low that it becomes routine beyond the low Earth orbit? And if that does happen, will it lose its potential to inspire? Uh, that's a, a brilliant question. And by the way, thanks for making that video. I mean, my words have been out there, and I, I'm, I'm always impressed when something that just sort of lives out there gets in the hand of a creative person, an artist, a videographer, a sculptor, whatever, and they then create a whole new meaning for that piece of information or that knowledge. And so uh, I'm honored and, and, and charmed by your interest in my words. Uh, so uh, I think the cost to space exploration is not the issue here. Um, it's already cheap relative to other things we do as a nation. Just look at the fraction of NASA's budget com uh, of, of the total federal budget. You know, it's one half of 1%. I say take it to 1%, that's all. Everyone who thinks we're spending too much money doesn't know that it's that cheap. That it's that cheap. I want to start a movement that said uh, all federal agencies should get a budget that equals what people think they're getting. <laughs> if that were the case, NASA's budget would go up by a factor of 10. All right? So 
in the big picture, it's not that expensive. And the, my point here that I, was make, that I make in the book and I made earlier in this interview is that when you do that activity, you stoke the economy in a way that the returns to the economy vastly exceed that, in, that original investment. When you view it as an, an investment, all you care about is the, is the return higher than what you put out. And if it is, then in some ways the cost doesn't really matter as long as you're getting that ROI. So then if it's cheap, all the better. I don't think the, the mystique will go away. If you can make a discovery on the cheap, do it. Hi. What happens is when something is cheap, everybody does it. And so other countries will do it if you're not organized enough. So the real big discoveries tend to be the more expensive ones. But I, for me, it doesn't matter which. How do you translate that value, though, to a public that is struggling economically? We've got a huge jobless rate. And, and it, the, the, the benefits of space exploration seem so distant and disconnected from people's daily lives. And while you do get media attention, it's, sh it's short-lived. There, there's a discovery, everybody's on it, and then they're on to something else the next day. How do you, how do you create a, a lasting message that uh, puts people behind the program? Yeah, so that's an important question because what you're saying is people see space, and sure, it's cool if we can afford it, but if we can't afford it, I'd rather feed my family. Yeah. Right? That's the kind of comparison that's always been made. And I will never say that the nation should commit to space because I like it or because we should discover because that's what humans do. Or no, or because there are cool spin offs. No. That's all true, but I will not, I, I'm not, I'm not naive, so naive to believe that that's sufficient to convince a nation, a nation to divert its resources into that activity. But we, as a democracy, and as a capitalist democracy, people do understand money. And here we are worried that our jobs are going overseas. You know why our jobs are going overseas? Because other people figured out how to do it, and they'll do it for less. If you're an innovation nation, if your culture has changed, because every day of your life you wake up and say, there's a future that I just dreamt that I want to want to make happen today. And that future is, is one where we're making discoveries and there are new objects, new materials, new, new patents, new technologies. That's a world in which you invent things and forge the economies of the 21st century. And it's the culture that space creates not specifically space itself, that births an economy of the future. And so, I, that yes, it takes slightly longer than the proverbial elevator ride to explain. It's, you invest in space, it makes headlines, kids read the headlines, they want to become scientists and engineers, and that's an interest that transcends how good their teacher is. They become scientists and engineers. There are great jobs they can do coming out of it. And if not, they invent something else with their talent. And up emerges a wave of innovation that transforms the world in which you live. All right. On That's that, the world I'm talking about. And that is a perfect note to end this program on. Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson, such a pleasure having you on the program. Thank you so much for being here. Th thanks for having me. Now, on Monday, every February, the U.S. and Canada celebrate African American heritage during what's known as Black History Month. But has this really been an effective way of combating racism and achieving racial equality in America? Send us your thoughts and your questions on that. And until then, we'll see you online.